Confused about the cosmos? Can't tell a planet from a star? Then give us just five minutes and we'll show you what they are. Jack Horkheimer, Stargazer, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium, tells you all about the night sky and the biggest show of all, the universe. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and welcome to the first stargazer video, which in reality is the fourth star hustler video. The change in names having been made on the 21st birthday of our Star Hustler TV series back on November 4th, 1997. And not coincidentally, the name of this video, Make the Stars Your Own, was also the title of that last Star Hustler episode before we became Stargazer. The reason we chose Make the Stars Your Own is because it was a rewrite of an extremely popular episode which originally aired way back in 1986. And I think you'll understand why we chose it for both our final Star Hustler episode and the theme of this video after you see it. But before we show you the original 1986 episode, here's the version which aired all around the world during the first week of November, 1997. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And would you believe 21 years ago this week, Star Hustler began? And would you also believe that after 21 years, Star Hustler ends this week? But only in a sense, because it's going to be reborn in next week's episode with a new name, Jack Horkheimer, Stargazer. Now, the reason for the change is quite simple. You see, our show has evolved over the years, and quite frankly, the word hustler doesn't mean exactly what it did 21 years ago. So, for this final episode of Star Hustler, I've decided to retell a story I told many years ago, which embodies the very essence of this show, and that is Make the Stars your own. Let me show you. Okay, we've got our skies set up so that we're facing due north any night during any November between 8 and 10 p.m., where we can see five stars above the North Star, which, if we draw lines between them, look like a squashed-out letter M. Now, the ancient Greeks pictured a stick figure of a chair here, the throne of Queen Cassiopeia of ancient Ethiopia, and although we still use the Greek name of this constellation, Cassiopeia, different cultures have had different names for these stars and all the other stars you see in the heavens. And in fact, if you look at the stars often enough and long enough, you will probably invent some of your own constellations, star patterns you can call your own. Indeed, Cassiopeia is a star pattern I made my own a long time ago because she always reminds me that if it hadn't been for someone special, my love for the stars might have passed with my youth. She ran a weekly newspaper in the small town of Randolph, Wisconsin, where I grew up, and she was the most insatiably curious person I've ever known. One night, when I was a young man, she looked up and said, you know, I've seen those stars since I was a little girl, and I've always wondered if they have names. Well, I knew they did, but I couldn't remember. So I later looked them up, and for some strange reason, my passion for the stars was rekindled, and my life changed forever. My friend's name was B. Williams, and Cassiopeia always reminds me of her because when this constellation is upside down beneath the North Star, the M turns into a W, W for Williams. And when it's above the North Star, its M reminds me of Beatrice's only child, Marie. So that night, long ago, I made a constellation my own. I thought I'd tell you about this because maybe you have seen a pattern of stars that reminds you of someone or something special, and to tell you not to feel foolish if you want to make and name a star pattern of your own. It's a wonderful way to connect with the cosmos. And whatever happened to my two friends? Well, 
B died at the age of 91 almost a dozen years ago, just before I wrote the original of this episode. Marie, however, is still a very good friend of mine and is alive and well and kicking. And like you and me, thankful for the gift of the stars and knowing how wonderful it is to keep looking up. The gift of stars and make the stars your own. I can't even begin to tell you how much response we had to that final Star Hustler episode and to the original. In fact, whenever I lecture around the country, invariably someone comes up to me and tells me how after they saw the original episode, they went out and made the stars their own, just the way people have been doing for thousands of years. Because all star myths, all star legends are simply the way various peoples of various cultures populated the heavens with their own histories, their own heroes, their own values. Even though sometimes to us many of these star stories and images don't seem to resemble anything at all in the sky according to our way of seeing things. In fact, there are very few star patterns which actually look like their names. Oh, Scorpius does, of course, and so does the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and Orion the Hunter. But more often than not, it really takes a stretch of the imagination to see how people could look up and name stars for the things they did. Perhaps we should remember that our ancestors really didn't mean for the star patterns to be literal star pictures any more than we mean for the state of Washington on a map to resemble a profile of our first president. People simply created star patterns as reminders of things which were important to them, especially before the invention of writing, when it was very difficult to pass along personal, tribal, or cultural history. Indeed, for thousands of years, parents would take their children out under the skies at night, look up and say, you see that group of stars over there? Well, whenever you look at that group of stars, I want you to remember this person or event, which is important to our family, our tribe, our civilization. And sure enough, years later, these grown-up children would take their children out under the stars and tell them the same stories. And thus, for hundreds and thousands of years, all cultures use the stars as a sort of library to pass along their own beliefs and their own traditions. So it's perfectly natural if you go outside some night and see a grouping of stars that reminds you of someone or something to make it your own. Like whenever I see Cassiopeia from Bea and Marie. Indeed, if you learn nothing else from this video, I'd like you to remember one thing. Go outside some night, use your imagination, and come up with your own star patterns. Make the stars your own. And while you're out there, remember that you can also give the gift of stars. And what better time to share a starry gift than the one day a year set aside for lovers, Valentine's Day. Let me show you. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And because the color red is always associated with Valentine's Day, we thought we'd give you a special cosmic red Valentine, one which you can share with your loved one or even your not-so-loved one if you choose. Let me show you. Okay, we've got our skies set up for any Valentine's Day night for any year as long as you live. And if you go out on any Valentine's Day night between the hours of 8 and 9 p.m. and look due south, you will see a very bright red star shining high above the horizon. Indeed, it is the brightest red star we can see with a naked eye from planet Earth. And just coincidentally, it reaches its highest point above the horizon on every Valentine's Day between the hours of 8 and 9 p.m. It marks the shoulder star of the great sky giant Orion the Hunter. And its name is Betelgeuse, which in Arabic means the armpit, 
which isn't very romantic for Valentine's Day. But if you want to give your beloved a really big Valentine, well, this is about as big a one as you'll ever find. You see, if we do some comparison of Beetlejuice, our Valentine star, with our own star, the Sun, and our own planet, the Earth, well, you'll understand why. Now, we all know that our Earth is 8,000 miles wide, pretty dinky, compared to our Sun, which is 865,000 miles wide. But to really understand their differences in size, just try to imagine that we could actually fit over one million Earths inside our sun. However, to understand the size of Betelgeuse really takes a stretch because we could fit over 160 million of our suns inside it when it's at its smallest size. And I say smallest size because Betelgeuse is one of those stars that changes its size regularly like a humongous, slowly pulsating heart that beats only once every six years. In fact, when Betelgeuse is fully contracted and at its minimum size, it is still about 500 times the diameter of our sun. But when it expands to its maximum size, it stretches to almost 900 times our sun's width. Or if you care to think about it this way, if we could place Betelgeuse where our sun is, at its minimum, Betelgeuse would stretch out all the way past the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, all the way to Mars. And at its maximum, would reach all the way to Jupiter. Wow! So there you have it. A great big humongous valentine for your sweetheart, courtesy of your neighborhood galaxy. And to see it simply go outside any clear Valentine's night between 8 and 9 p.m., look due south, and there you'll see it at its highest above the horizon. But just to play it safe, and so as not to look like a cheapskate, I still recommend you purchase that traditional box of chocolates. Besides, it will be great fun to eat by the light of the great Valentine's star if you simply remember to keep looking up. You see, making the stars your own can really be fun. I mean, I never thought of Beetlejuice as a Valentine star until I was getting ready to write the Stargazer episodes for February of 98, when I just happened to look up and all of a sudden realized that bright red Beetlejuice would be at its highest point above the horizon in early evening on Valentine's Day. And when I mentioned it to some colleagues of mine, we all said the same thing. Now, why haven't I ever thought of that before? <laughs> At any rate, my friend B's three favorite stars also just happen to be right here in the heavens. And I'll just bet you that they're the three favorite stars of many of you watching this. And although I mentioned how much I love the sound of their names in my first video, what I didn't tell you is that they've had many names in many cultures and in the past century even caused something of a small political tiff between the French and the British as each country attempted to make these three stars their own. Their names are Alnatak, Alnalam, and Mintaka and they belong to a star pattern which is perhaps the most recognizable and easiest to find of all star patterns once you know where to look for it. Now, some of you out there, I'm sure, already know the constellation of stars to which Alnatak, Alnalam, and Mintaka belong. And even though it is one of the best known and beloved of all star patterns, nevertheless, the names of these three stars are not heard very often. Give up? Okay. These three stars are part of Orion, the mighty hunter, and make up his great starry belt. And to find Orion and these three belt stars, simply go outside any clear night in February between the hours of 8 and 10 p.m., your local time, and look south. And there, smack dab right in front of you, you'll be able to see these three belt stars, equally spaced in a row. The only three stars so precisely spaced apart in the entire heavens. Now, 
Orion's other stars are more famous and mentioned by name much more often. For instance, the two stars which mark his shoulders are named Betelgeuse and Bellatrix. And the two stars which make up his knees are called Scythe and Rigel. Betelgeuse and Rigel are familiar to most science fiction fans, especially Rigel, which seems to turn up forever on reruns of Star Trek. But my personal favorite stars in Orion are his belt stars, perhaps because they are so incredibly easy to identify, and because I just love the sound of their names. <laughs> and once more, in their proper order, is Alnatok to your left as you face Orion, Alnalam in the middle, and Mintaka on the right. Now it seems that throughout history, these three stars have fascinated everyone who has ever bothered to look up at the night sky, perhaps because they are so obviously equally spaced, almost as if with some mysterious purpose. Many cultures have called them many names. For instance, native Australians of long, long ago called them the three dancers, three young men dancing a wild native Australian dance called the corroboree. And incidentally, ancient Australians also said that the music to which these young men danced was played by a group of young musician maidens, maidens nearby. The ladies we call in Western culture, the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. Now in ancient Greenland, the belt stars were called the seal hunters, who after having become hopelessly lost at sea, were transported to the heavens by a friendly god. Ancient sailors have also called these three stars the golden yard arm. Ancient church corers variously called these three stars the three magi, the three kings, and the three Marys. Also, Jacob's rod or staff, and even Our Lady's wand. And weirdly, for reasons unknown to anyone alive, some Laplanders still refer to these three stars as a tavern, a cosmic saloon. And even stranger, at least to my way of thinking, is the name the University of Leipzig gave these three stars in 1807 when it dubbed them Napoleon, which caused immediate indignation and retaliation by an offended Englishman, who got back at the French by renaming them Lord Nelson. But these three stars by any name look the same, if you just keep looking up. Talk about making the stars your own, and for political purposes at that. Oh well, I guess we should be grateful that modern advertising agencies haven't completely taken over the night sky as an advertising medium. Although there are a few examples around which I will not mention. I mean, can you imagine if back in the 30s, Hollywood renamed these stars Groucho, Harpo, and Zeppo? Or even worse, Larry Curley and Moe? And even though we've all heard of Orion Pictures, nevertheless, I'm very thankful that no one decided to use the three belt stars as a promo for a trilogy, like the Star Wars trilogy, or worse yet, The Godfather Parts 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> Be that as it may, the constellation Orion has been called by many different names by many different cultures, usually for their great heroes or gods. But if you ask most amateur astronomers what their favorite object is in Orion the Hunter, they probably won't tell you Betelgeuse or the three belt stars. No, indeed, it is the middle star of the three dim stars suspended below Orion's belt, which are popularly called the sword stars. But if you look very close at the middle star of the sword, it looks strange, kind of fuzzy. And no matter how hard you try to focus on it, it won't appear as a sharp, crisp point of light. In fact, if you look at it with a pair of binoculars, it will look slightly bigger, but even fuzzier. But the strangeness of that middle sword star becomes even more apparent if we take a very long time exposure photograph of it through a good amateur telescope, because what develops is truly mind-blowing. Indeed, the middle sword star is not a star at all. 
but a huge nursery of many stars, born less than a million years ago, with many more still cocooned in their embryonic gas clouds yet awaiting birth. And called the Orion Nebula, it is incredibly far away, 1,600 light years beyond, which means that when we look at it in our century, we see the light that left it 16 centuries ago. And now let's take a journey just a few hundred light years out into space so we can get a closer look. And as we draw closer and closer and closer, keep in mind that while our entire solar system is less than one light day in diameter, this birthplace of stars is 30 light years in diameter. Think of it. This humongous stellar nursery is 30 light years in diameter. That's more than 20,000 times the diameter of our entire solar system. And there is enough gaseous star stuff here to make 10,000 more stars like our sun. And believe it or not, only four newly born stars within it, shaped like a baseball diamond, light up all the surrounding gas from which new stars will be born. And although 1,600 light years away, this gaseous nebula is still so incredibly bright that even our ancestors noted that the middle star in Orion's sword appeared not to be a star at all, but some strange kind of fuzzy light. So, sometime this February, go outside between 8 and 10 p.m., look due south, and contemplate this wonder of the universe that we, in our time, are privileged to be the first to truly understand. Wow, what a wonderful time to keep looking up. But even more wonderful is the fact that every few months or so, we discover even more wonderful things in the Orion Nebula through the magic of our high-tech spacecraft. In fact, just recently, the Hubble Space Telescope aimed its cameras at the heart of the trapezium region of the Great Nebula and discovered objects that look like some kind of space pods, which are actually protoplanetary disks. That is, humongous disks of gas and dust out of which planetary systems eventually may form, just like our own planetary system around our sun. But what's even more incredible is that when Hubble photographed the dark center of one of these protoplanetary disks in infrared, the dark central spot glowed, which means that not only are we seeing gigantic disks out of which planets may form, but we're also probably looking at the dense shell of gas and dust at the center out of which a star will soon be born. At any rate, even though Orion is a favorite constellation of winter, other seasons also have their favorites. Which leads us to a question many viewers ask. Why do the stars change with the seasons? Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And you know, just as we have seasons here on Earth, so too do the heavens have their seasons. You see, because our Earth rotates on its axis once every 24 hours from west to east, the stars appear to slowly drift across the sky in the opposite direction, from east to west. So, if our Earth were perfectly stationary in the heavens, we would see the same star patterns in the same spot at the same time every single night. But, because our Earth is not stationary and makes one journey around the sun once every 365 days, our Earth changes its position in respect to the stars a little bit each night, so that if a given star rises on the horizon at 8 o'clock one night, the following night that same star will rise four minutes earlier and will be approximately one degree farther along on its journey across the night sky at 8 p.m., which further means that after a month, any given star will be 30 degrees farther along on its journey across the sky at 8 p.m., which further means that after a quarter of a year, any given star will have moved 90 degrees or a quarter of the way around the entire sky 
at 8 p.m. And since each season is about a quarter of a year long, this means that any season you go out at 8 p.m., the stars overhead will be much different than the stars overhead the previous or the following season. Now, a sure sign of spring skies is the appearance of Leo the lion in early evening, and in winter, Orion the hunter. So, from winter's Orion, let's spring like a lion to hunt down more stories of how our ancestors made the stars their own. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargaters. And boy, don't you just love spring. I mean, although I really love the brilliant stars of winter, I also really look forward to the soft, muted stars of spring that echo the gentle colors of Earth's landscape in early spring. And you know, I have always been fascinated by folklore, especially phrases that we learn during childhood and repeat all our lives and frequently have little or no idea where they came from. For instance, I'm sure all of you have heard that old phrase that if March weather comes in like a lion, it'll go out like a lamb and vice versa. But have you ever wondered where this phrase came from? Well, my astronomical colleague, Guy Otwell, who produces a wonderful yearly astronomical calendar, has long suggested that maybe this phrase got its imagery from the heavens. Let's take a look. Okay, we've got our skies set up for the first day of March in a year, about 8 p.m. your local time. And if you are far from city lights and you go outside and look toward the northwest, you will see the dim stars that make up Aries the Ram, or Lamb. But if you look almost opposite about the same height above the horizon in the northeast, you will see the constellation Leo the Lion. So here we have wonderful night sky images that match our phrase, a lion and a lamb both about the same height above the horizon in early evening on the 1st of March. But what will you see if you go out at the same time after a month has passed on March 31st? Well, quite a different story because on March 31st at 8 p.m., the lion will be almost overhead and the lamb will be smack dab on the western horizon. Now, we all know that usually the weather at the end of March is milder than the weather at the beginning of March. So our skies at 8 p.m. on the last day of March with the lamb setting support the fact that March is going out like a lamb. However, if we turn our skies back to March 1st, 8 p.m., we see that the lion is rising into the night sky at the beginning of March, which supports the fact that March usually begins with fiercer weather, comes in like a lion. So, perhaps long ago, someone tied this all together, noticing that on the first day of March, Leo the lion was rising up into the heavens, whereas at the end of March, Aries the lamb was leaving them, and thus decided to poetically link them both to the weather, and came up with that old phrase, simply borrowing from the heavens in an attempt to correlate the seasonal changing of the constellations with the seasonal changing of the weather. But as far as astronomers are concerned, March will always come in with Leo the lion rising and will always go out with Aries the lamb setting. Whatever, may you always have clear skies in March for viewing the lion and the lamb, which is easy if you remember to keep looking up. Fascinating, isn't it, that such a simple phrase turns out to have its origins in the stars? And like Winter's Orion, Spring's Leo the Lion also became the focus of the myths and legends of many ancient peoples. And my favorite happens to be an old Roman legend, a story so universal and so touching that it has been retold many different ways by many authors, poets, 
and even composers, even into the 20th century. So, for the next few minutes, I'd like you to just sit back, relax, and imagine that we're all outside under the stars, without any special effects or actors, and let me simply tell you this story of two star-crossed lovers, just the way the ancient Romans told it long, long ago. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and this week, let's roll back the centuries and look upon a distant springtime long ago when love was as fresh and new and wonderful as it is now. I'd like to tell you an ancient tale which focuses on the star pattern that is the symbol of spring itself, Leo the Lion, who serves as an annual reminder of both the happiness of love won and the tragedy of love lost, as perennial as spring itself. Now our story was told by the great Roman poet Ovid over 2,000 years ago. And surely most Roman children at one time or another heard this tale. The tale of two young lovers, handsome Paramus and the beautiful Thisbe. Now like Romeo and Juliet, the young lovers in Shakespeare's time, Paramus and Thisbe had to love in secret because their parents were against the match. And like Romeo, stealthily seeking out Juliet in the dark of the night, climbing up trees to her balcony, Paramus likewise met Thisbe in the dark of night, and they talked to each other of love through cracks in the wall which separated their homes from one another. Unable even to touch each other because of this wall, finally one soft spring night they decided to risk the anger of their parents and agreed to secretly meet in a distant woods. But Thisbe, arriving first, was horrified to see in the shadows of a large tree a huge lion devouring a traveler taken by surprise. Frightened, she quietly ran off to warn Paramus and to get help. But as she ran, she lost her veil, which fluttered past the lion who snatched at it and stained it with the traveler's blood. Then Paramus, arriving a short time later, saw the veil, which he immediately recognized. And with no other thought but that the lion had killed Thisbe, Paramus attacked the lion with his small sword. But Paramus was no match and was quickly killed. Meanwhile, Thisbe, who was unable to find any help whatsoever, rushed back to the woods, desperately hoping that she was not too late to warn her lover. But when she found Paramus, he was already dead, and she fell upon his body in grief. Well, you can guess the rest, because lurking in the shadow still was the lion. And on seeing Thisbe, he killed her too. Thus, as with Romeo and Juliet, Paramus and Thisbe were finally united forever, but in death. Well, their families, upon seeing both their children taken from them forever, realized the folly of their quarrel, but too late. It was also later said that the lion's attack was so severe that a nearby mulberry tree was completely covered with the lover's blood. And so, that ever since, even to this day, that is why mulberry trees bear red fruit instead of white. It was also said that Jupiter took such pity on these two young lovers that as a constant reminder to mankind of true love, he put Thisbe's veil among the stars, where we can see it flutter still, wafted by an eternal cosmic wind, directly behind the lion in the stars of Coma Berenices. And to see this veil for yourself, all you have to do is remember to keep looking up. The parallels between Paramus and Thisbe and Romeo and Juliet are obvious, right down to the feuding families. And the story was again retold in Leonard Bernstein's wonderful West Side Story. The feuding families replaced by opposing street gangs. So, the next time you look at Leo, 
I would like you to remember that we still tell, in some form or other, the same great stories our ancestors told. But I would also like you to remember that we now know the reality, that is, the science of the stars of Leo. Okay, we've got our skies set up for any clear night just after sunset the next three weeks late May, early June. Facing west, we're approximately halfway up from the horizon to the zenith, you will see the stars which make up the constellation Leo the Lion. Right now, he is headed face down, straight for the horizon. A backward question mark or sickle-shaped group of stars mark his head, mane, and forefront. The brightest star, Regulus, which means little king, marking his heart. Then higher in the sky and forming a perfect right triangle, three stars make up Leo's hind section. The brightest star being the nebula, meaning the lion's tail. And it is these two brightest stars of Leo, Regulus and the nebula, which we're going to look at more closely. Let's start with the nebula, which may sound familiar to many of you, because another bright star in the sky called Deneb marks the tail of Cygnus the Swan. So if we add Ola to Deneb, we get Denebola, which literally means tail of the lion, which the lion would be very proud to wag if lions do indeed wag their tails. Indeed, this tail star is intrinsically almost as impressive as Sirius the dog star, which is the brightest star in the sky. In fact, if we could move to Nebula as close to Earth as Sirius is, only eight and a half light years away, the Nebula would rival Sirius in brilliance. But because the Nebula is five times farther away, 43 light years beyond Earth, only its distance makes it less impressive than Sirius. Even so, compared to our sun, the nebula is a much grander star. Almost twice the diameter of our sun, it shines with a luminosity equal to 20 of our suns. But impressive as the nebula is, however, Regulus is even more impressive. And although Regulus is exactly twice the distance away from us as the nebula, 85 light years away, it still outshines the nebula. And that is because Regulus is five times the diameter of our sun and shines with a luminosity of 160 of our suns. Impressive indeed for the heart of the king of the beasts. The science of Leo and the mythology of Leo. What a wonderful combination. But now, let's move to a constellation which most people in northern latitudes can see every night of the year because it rides so closely around the North Star. A constellation which the Romans, and just coincidentally the American Indians, called the Great Bear, and which Europeans call the Plow or the Wagon, but which we Americans have made our own, naming it for a utensil all early Americans used for dipping water out of a bucket, the Big Dipper. Okay, we've got our sky set up for early evening, April or May. And if you look north, you should be able to find the Big Dipper without any difficulty. Four stars trace out a cup, and three stars behind them make its handle. But we're going to pay attention to what looks like, to most people, one star at the bend of the handle a star named Mizar, which in Arabic means a girdle or a waistband. But if you have really good eyesight and look real close at Mizar, you will see a slightly dimmer star, a star called Elcor, which in Arabic means the lost one or the friendless one. Now, centuries ago, it was said that these two stars, bright Mizar and dimmer Elcor, were used as a kind of ancient eye test for one of the Sultan's armies. If you could see the two stars, you were in, and if you couldn't, you were out. But most people could see the two stars, even though nowadays I have to use my glasses. 
But even if you can see these two stars, which are now popularly called the horse and the rider, bright Mizar being the horse, dimmer Alcor being the rider, you still are not seeing the whole picture. For there is much more to this horse and rider than meets the naked eye. You see, if we could use a special device called a spectroscope and aim it at the rider, we would see that the so-called friendless one is not so friendless after all. Indeed, he has a companion star, invisible to the naked eye, thus making Elcor two riders on Miser's horse. But hold on just a second, that's not exactly true either. Because if you look very closely at Mizar with astronomical instruments, we will see that Mizar is not just one star. In fact, it is not even a double star, or a triple star, or a quadruple star, but is in fact a rare quintuple star. In other words, when we look at the ancient Arab solitary horse with its friendless rider, we are in reality looking at two horsemen driving a team of five horses across the night sky at the bend in the handle of the dipper. Incredible, isn't it? What modern astronomy reveals about objects in the heavens that generations of mankind have seen for thousands of years. So, sometime this spring, go outside and look for the ancient horse and rider, two visible stars which we now know are in reality seven. Wow, sometimes it's mind-boggling when you go out and remember to keep looking up. Mind-boggling indeed. And you know, in a real sense, we of the 20th century have really made the night sky our own because inside each of the ancient constellations we now see with high-tech astronomy the wonders of the stars as they really are and not as just a reflection of our own personal culture but because we belong to the great family of humanity past as well as present we should never forget the wonderful stories woven into the stars so as we leave the Big Dipper, I would like to add a rather poignant observation about how an entire race of oppressed peoples made the stars their own. Because during the American Civil War, the slaves of the South, as they escaped to the North, were always told to follow the drinking gourd to freedom. Because the drinking gourd, the Big Dipper, always points North. And now, to something else which was named even before the Romans. The zodiac and its signs, and the most peculiar sign of them all, which you can see every summer. Now, everyone has heard that word zodiac over and over again, but what is it really? Well, simply put, it is a band which extends completely around the sky, which represents the path that the sun, the moon, and the planets travel along. And a long time ago, this band was divided into 12 parts called signs, each sign representing a person or animal, something alive. Or to make it really simple, the zodiac represents a line of living things around the sky. The word zodiac coming from zoo, which originated with the Greek word zoion, meaning animals or living things. Now we count the signs of the zodiac from west to east. That is from right to left, if we face due south. And the two most prominent signs of the zodiac, which we can see in summertime, are Scorpius the scorpion and Sagittarius the centaur archer. These are followed respectively by Capricornus, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, and Libra. All living things. But hold on just a minute, you say, one of the signs of the zodiac isn't a living thing. And you're right, even though its two most famous and tongue-twisting stars are indeed living things, or at least they were, until ancient political surgery. Give up which sign I'm talking about? Okay, I'll show you. 
Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and once again, it's Zubin El Janubi and Zubin El Shamali time. So, loosen up your tongue, fasten your cosmic seatbelts, and let's go outside to find them. Okay, we've got our sky set up for any night the next couple of weeks, just after it gets dark out. And if you look south, you will see the giant fishhook-shaped constellation of Scorpius the Scorpion, followed by the teapot-shaped portion of Sagittarius. But up and to the right of the fishhook of Scorpius, you will see two semi-bright stars with some of the strangest sounding names in the heavens, Zubin El Janubi and Zubin Es Shamali. In Arabic, Zubin El Janubi means the Southern Claw, while Zubin Es Shamali means the Northern Claw. And a couple thousand years ago, they were the claws of the scorpion. But then Julius Caesar and his cronies came along and lopped them off and renamed them Libra the Scales for the symbol of Roman justice, which I'm sure led many an ancient stargazer to mutter, there ought to be a law. At any rate, these two stars are wonderful. And although they appear visually to be the same brightness from Earth, actually they are very, very different. For instance, Zubin El Janubi is about 65 light years away from our planet Earth and shines 25 times brighter than our own sun. And it is approaching us at the incredible speed of six miles per second. And upon closer examination, we also find that Zubin El Janubi is not just one, not even two, but three stars. Two of them so close together that they orbit each other once every 20 days. On the other hand, Zubin El Shamali, the northern claw, is over twice as far away as Zubin El Janubi, being 140 light years distant. And although it appears the same brightness as its claw companion, it isn't. Indeed, it is six times brighter than Zubin El Janubi, which means that it is over 150 times brighter than our sun. And it is speeding toward us four times faster than Zubin El Janubi at a rate of 21 miles per second. And Zubin Es Shamali is also the center of a centuries-old debate. You see, over 2,000 years ago, it was listed as the brightest of all the stars of the Scorpion, even brighter than Antares. A few centuries later, however, the great astronomer Ptolemy described Antares as equal to Zubin Es Shamali in brightness. But today, Antares appears five times brighter. Has Zubin Es Shamali dimmed over the past 2,000 years? Or conversely, has Antares gotten much, much brighter? At any rate, it's always fun to try to pronounce these two tongue twisters of summer. So, Get the outside to do some Zubin El Janubi-ing and Zubin El Shamali-ing. It's easy if you just keep looking up. Talk about making the stars your own in celestial politics. I'll just bet the Babylonians who came up with the original concept of the Zodiac were pretty burned at the Romans declawing their scorpion and making it their own. But one Roman in particular, Julius Caesar, was extremely good at making things his own. After all, he not only revised the calendar, he had it named after himself, the Julian calendar, and was bold enough to be the first man in history to name an entire month for himself when he took the old Roman month of Quintilis and renamed it July for Julius. But if you think that's bad, the Romans also moved the beginning of the year from the first day of spring to the first day of January, which was simply the day all new Roman officials took office. Talk about politics, terrestrial and celestial. 
<laughs> at any rate, in addition to all ancient cultures making the stars their own, most societies also made the moon their own. Now, many civilizations have named each full moon of the year for things which to them seemed peculiar or special about a particular full moon. For instance, we all know that the harvest moon was so named because it came at the traditional time of harvest in mid-European latitudes. Conversely, the full moon of May was called the planting moon. So what do you think the full moon of December should be called? The Christmas moon? The long underwear moon? Perhaps today, the plastic moon for all the overextended credit cards at this time of year. But no, it's not called any of these, although Christmas moon is close because one of the names for the full moon of December is the moon before Yule, which is very appropriate. But equally appropriate is one of its other names, the long night moon, because it occurs so close to the winter solstice, the first day of winter. Because we all know that on the winter solstice, days are shortest and nights are longest. Long night moon. But I think we could give this moon yet another name, which would further describe its uniqueness. The moon of the short shadows. Let me explain. Okay, we've got our sky set up for the third week of June, the first day of summer, the summer solstice. And if we could speed up time and dim the sun down so we could watch it all day, we would see that it takes an extremely high path across the sky. But if we watch the full moon of June all night long, we would notice that it takes an extremely low path across the sky. In fact, the full moon closest to the summer solstice is the lowest riding full moon of the year. And if you've ever been outside under the full moon of June, far from city lights, you probably noticed that the June full moon casts very long shadows. In fact, I remember as a kid walking down a country road under a June moon and watching my long shadow stretch out in front of me. So we have a situation in summer where the summer sun rides high across the sky, but the summer full moon rides low. And guess what? You've got it. Just the opposite occurs at the winter solstice. You see, at the winter solstice, the sun takes an extremely low path across the sky and the full moon a very high one. Indeed, the highest path of any full moon of the year, which makes everybody's shadow extremely short. And if you don't believe me, see for yourself. Go outside this weekend around midnight when the moon is at its very highest and see just how short your moon's shadow really is. And do you know why we can see the full moon longer in winter than we can in summer? Simple. Nights are longer in winter. So get the outside some night this weekend when the full moon will be at its highest for the year and your moon shadow will be at its shortest. Isn't it fun to keep looking up? Of course, the full moon of December doesn't always occur on a weekend, as it did when I wrote the episode you just saw. But the full moon closest to the first day of winter will always give you the shortest shadow of the year. Now, personally, my favorite names for the full moons of the year are from the various tribes of the American Indians, because they are so poetically and realistically descriptive. For instance, various tribes called the full moon of February the snow moon, the hunger moon, and the wolf moon. And what could be more poetic than the moon of the popping trees, the sound winter trees make as their ice-covered branches snap as the ice cracks. So not only have the stars been made their own by every culture, so too the moon. But perhaps no one 
has made the moon so completely their own as we of the 20th century. Because from now on, no one will ever see the moon the way our ancestors did since we made it our own by landing on it, naming many of its features for our scientists and astronomers. Even the moon's most popular feature, the man or woman in the moon, has been updated. And to show you just how much, I'd like you to see an episode we aired in July of 1994 entitled, Astronauts in Her Hair, or Is the Lady in the Moon Named Wilma? Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And although it seems like only yesterday to me, this week marks the 25th anniversary of man's first landing on the moon. And to commemorate that monumental step and leap for mankind, I'd like to show you exactly how to find the Apollo 11 landing site using nothing more than your naked eye. Plus, give you some basic lunar facts which confuse many people, namely lunar phases. Now, understand first that there is no such thing as moonlight. Any lighted part of the moon that we see is simply reflected sunlight. And one half of the moon is always fully lit by the sun. The reason we see the moon grow from a slender sliver to full and back to a slender sliver is because the moon is changing its place with respect to the sun and the earth as it makes one trip around the earth once a month. So at the phase of the moon we call new moon, we see no moon whatsoever from earth, even though one half of the moon, the back half, is completely lit. At new moon, the moon is lined up between the earth and the sun. But a couple of days later, as the moon moves along in its orbit, out of line with the earth and the sun, we begin to see a small portion of the lighted half of the moon. And by the time the moon becomes full, the moon is directly opposite where it was when it was new. So now the lighted half of the moon is the half that faces earth. And the half of the moon that was lighted during new moon, the back half, is now completely dark. Then, as the moon travels back toward the sun, we gradually see the lighted portion of the moon become less and less night after night. Until, once again, when the moon is lined up between the earth and the sun, the half of the moon that is lit is the side facing away from Earth. New moon. And think of this. Did you know that the Earth also goes through phases just like the moon? It does. And Earth phases as seen from the moon are just the opposite of moon phases as seen from Earth. For instance, 25 years ago, when the Apollo 11 crew landed on the Sea of Tranquility, we on Earth saw a first quarter moon, whereas the astronauts saw a last quarter Earth. Phases, whether moon or Earth, are simply a matter of where the Earth, moon, and sun happen to be in relation to each other. And if you'd like to see exactly where those first astronauts landed, I'll show you, easy as pie. First, look for the lady in the moon. At full moon, she will be looking up, and the crater Tycho, with its bright rays, will be her necklace. Her hair is done up in an old-fashioned pompadour, almost exactly like Wilma of the Flintstones. And the Apollo 11 astronauts landed in the lower part of Wilma's hair, in front of and slightly above her ear. And you don't need a telescope to see it. Whatever. May your Apollo Silver Anniversary Night be lunar bright, and of course, keep looking up. Of course, you don't need the Silver Anniversary of Apollo to see the Lady in the Moon. She comes out every full moon as regular as celestial clockwork. And to see her for yourself, I would suggest you look at the previous episode a couple of times so you can get her image firmly planted in your mind 
and then go out and take a look. Because as our associate producer Bill Dishong says, once you recognize her, you'll never ever be able to not recognize her. At any rate, people have been making the moon their own for so long, it's even rubbed off on cats. And in case any of you have seen Odyssey magazine recently, you may have noticed that yours truly has become a cartoon character, although definitely not of the Flintstone variety. And in the April 98 issue, along with the help of cartoonist Rich Harrington, I told a moon cat. Tale. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. This month will tell a tale for cat lovers. Every month for a few nights, look west right after sunset and you will see a thin crescent moon. And in about 10 days, the sliver-like eye of the moon will open wide to full phase. It's a hardly noticed, slow but gradual awakening of Earth's celestial companion. Now, as you gaze up at this young moon, transport yourself back in time, 4,000 years to ancient Egypt. Imagine a pharaoh, his court and his priests waiting for the sun to set, their backs to the newly built pyramids. The sun's last rays glint off the huge stone monuments. Then, as the sky darkens, the crescent moon worshipped by these people as the moon cat goddess makes its appearance. Why a cat goddess? Because a cat's eyes change from narrow slits to full orbs as light conditions change, mimicking the moon's transformation from crescent to full orb. You can see this if you hold up your cat and face him or her toward any full moon, and your cat's eyes will go from being wide open in the dark to slits as they encounter the moon's brightness. It's as if the cat is winking at its celestial companion. And until next month, keep looking up. Fascinating, isn't it, that all cultures have so personalized objects in the night sky all throughout history? From the ancient Egyptians worshipping the moon as a cat goddess, to the French and British scrapping over whether or not Orion's belt stars should be called Napoleon or Lord Nelson. From the ancient Roman political mutilation of the scorpion, to the heartbreaking story of two lovers whose fate is recalled by a celestial lion. And of course, let us not forget a much more modern way to personalize the stars by giving the gift of Beetlejuice every Valentine's Day. Plus, the most personal way to relate to the night sky, make the stars your own. So, as I promised at the beginning of this video, I'd now like to take you back in time to December of 1986 and show you the original episode of Make the Stars Your Own. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And have you ever wondered how the stars and constellations got their names? Well, thousands of years ago before writing, Almost all ancient peoples used the stars as a way to pass on their history, their culture, things that were special to them. Take the star pattern Cassiopeia, for instance, which you can see any clear night this week by looking due north about 8 p.m. Now, if we draw lines between five of Cassiopeia's stars, Cassiopeia will look like a squashed out capital letter M to most of us. But the ancient Greeks saw this star pattern differently as a kind of a stick figure of a chair, a queen's throne on its side. Now, ancient Greek parents would take their children out under the heavens and show them the queen's chair and then tell them the story of Cassiopeia, the ancient queen of Ethiopia, who was punished for being so vain by being made to ride endlessly around the North Star on her throne, sometimes right side up and sometimes upside down. Almost upside down now in early evening in December, Cassiopeia and her chair will turn right side up if we wait a few hours and go outside around 
4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And although we in the Western world still use the Greek name of this constellation, Cassiopeia, many different cultures use different names for these particular stars. In fact, if you look at the stars often enough and long enough, you'll probably invent some of your own constellations, star patterns you can call your own. Indeed, Cassiopeia is a star pattern I made my own a long time ago because she always reminds me that if it hadn't been for one special person, my love for the stars might have passed with my youth. She ran a weekly newspaper in a small town in rural Wisconsin where I grew up, and she was the most insatiably curious person I think I've ever known. She asked questions about everything, and in such a way that made you want to find the answers. And what can be more fun for a kid than learning how to read upside down and backwards on galleys set with linotype. Well, like others who moved away after they grew up, whenever I went back, I always had to see her. And on one such visit during a not too happy time in my life, we were walking near a lake one evening when she looked up and said, you know, I've seen those stars since I was a little girl, and I've always wondered if they have names. Well, I knew they did, but I couldn't remember them. So when I got home, I went to my room and hunted for their names in a book of stars I had as a child. And in looking for their names that night, my passion for the stars was rekindled, and my life was changed forever. Well, my friend's name was B, B. Williams. And Cassiopeia always reminds me of her, because when this constellation is upside down beneath the North Star, her M turns into a W, a W for Williams, a constellation I have made my own. I thought I'd tell you about her because maybe you have seen a pattern of stars that reminds you of someone or something special. And to tell you not to feel foolish if you want to make and name a star pattern of your own. I also wanted to tell you about my friend because she died a few weeks ago at the age of 91. And I just wanted to say, farewell, B, and thank you. Thank you for the gift of stars and for reminding me how wonderful it is to keep looking up. And they say diamonds are forever. Not quite unless they are the diamonds that sparkle in the night sky. At any rate, maybe now you know why that episode has caused so much comment over the years. Even after we did the 1997 rewrite, which you saw at the beginning of this video, email and letters poured in. One especially, though, stands out, which I'd like to share with you. It reads, I just wanted to let you know how your show has affected my life. Last month, I got my dad interested in the stars and planets, and we got a pair of binoculars that he uses for football, and we gazed at Mars, Venus, and Jupiter. It was one of those father-son moments they make movies about. Well, last week, my dad unexpectedly passed away, and those memories of star and planet gazing are even more precious. But I have a baby daughter on the way, and I remembered a script of yours a couple of months ago where you said, make the stars your own. And you told the story about Cassiopeia and a childhood friend of yours. Well, I've been admiring the Orion constellation for the past month or so, and I love it. And guess what? I'm making it my own. Instead of Orion, I'm renaming it after my dad, and I can't wait to show my daughter, in a few years, her grandfather's constellation in the sky. So even after I'm gone one day, she will always be able to look up at the sky and remember us, and maybe teach her kids and grandkids the same thing. Sound familiar? It should, 
because that's what parents have been doing with their kids and the stars for thousands of years. He continues, I've learned that one of the many beauties of the stars is their immortality, their eternal quality. Indeed, and what better gift can you give than one that's immortal and eternal? The gift of stars, which is yours for the giving, if you make the stars your own. And remember to keep looking up.